Reducing 30-day hospital readmissions has become a national priority. According to the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute's County Health Rankings 2013, five of Kentucky's 10 least healthy counties are located within the Kentucky Appalachian Transition Service Area. Hospitals in the Appalachian Regional Health Care System are among those that have received maximum penalties during the first year of levies. ARH is partnering with CATS in the latter's project to improve care in the region. This is the CATS Journey. My name is Belinda Hall. I am the nursing supervisor with Extra Care. And my job basically is to provide staffing for not only our private duty nursing service that we offer, but also for the CATS program, which is the new transition services um, that we have partnered with ARH in order to um, follow our patients from hospital to home. We hire RNs, we hire LPNs that follow our patients, like I said, from hospital to home. And we have lead nurses that are actually located in each of the four ARH facilities. I'm the lead transitions nurse for the Hazard ARH Hospital. Um, so my role is pretty much I'm there Monday through Friday um, screening um, eligible patients um, that have Medicare Part A and B to see if they would qualify for the transitions program. I am uh, the lead screening nurse at the Whitesburg ARH Hospital. My responsibilities each day is I go to the hospital uh, I screen all the Medicare patients there at the hospital for eligibility and uh, then enroll to get them into the services to begin with. And I'm at the hospital Monday through Friday just about my entire day. That's where I spend my days. The CATS team chose Dr. Mary Naylor's transitional care model. The transitional care model is designed for frail elderly with two or more risk factors, a history of recent hospitalizations, multiple chronic conditions or medications, and poor rating of self-health. Okay. Well, CATS is the Kentucky Appalachian Transition Service. Um, it's a demonstration project of Medicare. We had recognized when they were doing the pilot program that sometimes the reasons that people were readmitted frequently was just the lack of understanding of maybe their medications, the lack of understanding the diagnosis that they really had, and also the support that they had at home. So by using the Naylor model that we chose, doing the multiple home visits, we felt like that it would be a better fit for our community, that we would have a longer time to provide the education for medication, for other resources in the community, uh, to be able to uh, relate with that family member that was actually the primary caregiver. Home nurses are just really falling in place. They're really, you know, working. We're all working together. Uh, and another story from just really recent, uh, there was a little lady uh, in the hospital and uh, she actually, had uh, cancer with meds to the brain. You know, you know, that's not actually what she was in the hospital for, but she had that diagnosis. Had a horrible, horrible decubitus on her bottom. Uh, they were using a wound back. It was just a very, very sad situation. I mean, she was very frail and emaciated. She weighed about 75 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I hesitated for the first few days she was there. Uh, I mean, I had went in and talked with the husband, but I didn't go full force because I really thought that she was going to be referred to hospice prior to leaving the hospital. But uh, they ended up, you know, the husband just could not let go, uh, could not give in to that hospice, you know, at, when she was discharged. Mm -hmm. So I'd already had picked her up and, you know, she, she went home. You know, and I called the home nurse, you know, and I told her, I said, you know, she's very, very weak. Uh, she, she really needs hospice services, but he was very hesitant. And she said, okay. So they, uh, she went out to do her first initial visit, and she called me back, and she was devastated. She said, if she makes it 48 hours, I'll be surprised. And she said, but he still says he does not want hospice. And I said, well... You know, just, just hang in there. Mm -hmm. So then the next day she called me back and she said, he called me back 
and he says he could he really needs hospice services now. So, you know, she was able to transition her yes. to the hospice services, you know, that they so desperately needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so she could stay her last days at home mm -hmm. and they really helped him. I think they're more comfortable uh, when you come in the home and you're sitting and talking to him as opposed to on the telephone because you're here for maybe 30 minutes. And so they've got all kinds of time to think about questions to ask you, things they may not know, um, you know, their medicines, making sure that all their medicines are correct. So I think it's a lot more beneficial to be in the home with them. You see progress. Um, every visit, you know, you see progress. First visit, he was on a cane. That was the end of that. You know, every, you know, each week I can see progress in him and in the strength and how far he could move that arm. And um, so, yeah, you can definitely see the progress every week when you come, which is pleasing, you know, to the nurse coming out. Health challenges for the southeastern Kentucky counties in Appalachia are related to poverty, obesity, literacy, availability of primary care physicians, uninsured population, diabetes, oral health, cardiovascular deaths, days of limited activities, and high rates of cancer, all descriptive of rural, medically underserved areas. Our community is very rural. We have partnered with four of the ARH hospitals. That would be Hazard ARH, Schwartzburg ARH, Tarlin ARH, and Williamson ARH. Um, our span of the community is about 21 counties. We cover about 6,000 square miles for the extra care private duty program that we use. And those four hospitals are spread out through that 6,000 miles so that we do reach out to um, a variety of community uh, members. I think as the program has grown, um, building relationships with all the downstream providers and the physicians, and uh, getting physicians and providers on board, um, just making them aware of what it is that we're, uh, we're about and what we're doing um, to help our patients. Um, you know, poverty is a big issue. Um, a lot of our patients are on street um, incomes, but just you know, so we try to seek out any, you know, medication assistance or any kind of assistance programs they might be eligible for. Um, sometimes patients, you know, refuse the program. Um, they don't necessarily want somebody to come in their home or for whatever reason um, may not be interested in the program. So I like the fact that we have the same nurse that sees them throughout the entire program. I think that's very beneficial. Um, one big thing we find is that there's just not a lot of community supports and community services out there. Um, we have successfully referred patients to, you know, uh, programs to help them with in-home services, things like that. But we often find that there's waiting lists um, okay. for home-delivered meals. There's waiting lists for in-home services, um, transportation for certain patients. We can get them, but for other patients that don't have um, certain insurance, you know, they're just not eligible and they can't afford the right um, mm -hmm. to pay. So that's a big, I think, um, barrier that, that we try to overcome. We try to find informal supports. Um, you know, we worked with churches to assist patients with food boxes and um, other things like that as well. For instance, there was a patient um, that one of our nurses was seeing in the home, and when she went out, the patient was eating crackers and mayonnaise. Um, that's what she had for dinner. She, her food stamps had ran out, and uh, that's what she had, so that's what she was eating. Um, so, of course, she, she went and, and purchased a food box for the patient, um, but then, you know, was able to, um, you know, reach out to other um, areas and organizations that can help with that, uh, with that particular need, because we try to look at the whole patient, mm -hmm. not just you were in the hospital for congestive heart failure, let's fix this so you don't have to go back. You know, sometimes it's, you know, they're discharged with, you know, the best antibiotic, but they don't have the however much money to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I've had patients to tell me that, that, well, I'm, I'm here because, you know, the doctor gave me this antibiotic, but I couldn't afford it, so I just got the cough syrup. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and that's just a good opportunity for us to provide teaching about, you know, when that happens, tell your pharmacist, ask your pharmacist if they can contact the doctor or that you can contact the doctor yourself because they want to know if you can't afford your medicine. You know, they want to help you. Sometimes there's a different medicine that may be cheaper that they could prescribe for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so just really activating the patient to take control of their health care and, and coaching them how to do that throughout the six weeks. Right. And we had another little man prior to that that uh, it was very, the home situation was not uh, 
dirty, but it was a very poverty-stricken home. Mm -hmm. And he was a CHL patient as well. And when we transitioned him home, uh, you know, I was the first one in and I was, you know, I'd done a home visit with them and, you know, and we were going over and, you know, the daughter was very uneducated, but she was more than willing to do anything that she had to do to keep her dad home. And she, uh, we were going over things and she had her in just a notebook, writing down everything and writing to write down his sugar, she said. And uh, then we talked about weighing him every day. And uh, she said, well, she said, uh, we don't have any scales. I can't afford any to, to weigh daddy. And I said, well, how do you determine when you need to give him his extra fluid pill that the doctor tells you to give and she said, well, I just look at his feet, and if they look like they're about to bust, I give him some extra. And I said, okay. I said, just, I said, I'll be back in about 30 minutes. <laughs> so I left, and uh, I didn't want her to know that I just had went to the near dollar store to buy her. So I said, I think I have, I know where I can get some supplies. So I went back with a set of scales, you know, and I said, here. This is a much easier way. And she was just ecstatic. She said, oh, I can, and I, you know, so we went over it and, and he done well. He yeah. done well and she done well. Mm -hmm. If you're not from this area, you would have a major uh, uh, language barrier, with, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. they don't take diuret, you know, they take water pills right. or they take a fluid pill, they take a sugar, sugar pill, yeah. they have a heart pill. I got, you know, they, it's, we speak our own language in this area. And sometimes it's just a, you know, a matter of communication. Yeah, you have to want yeah. to help these people. That's a great thing. You know, and you know, if you're not in it, I mean, if you're in it for some other reason, you know, you might as well not be there.